Thank you. I'm just going to read a brief statement. Um, due to the governor's declared state of emergency due to COVID-19, it is impractical and unsafe for the Board of Housing and Community Development to assemble in a single location. So the board meeting will be held electronically by video conference and telephone options uh, pursuant, pursuant to the amendments to the Appropriation Act. The purpose of the meeting is to discuss or transact the business statutorily required or necessary to continue the operation of the board and the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. Uh, the public is welcome to use the link and phone number made available to attend electronically, and the board will make a recording or transit available in accordance with the uh, time, frame, time frames established in 2.23707 and 2.23701.1 of the Code of Virginia. Uh, a few notes, votes will be roll call votes. The meeting is being recorded. And at the end of the meeting, if you are interested in um, submitting a survey questionnaire to the FOIA Council about electronic meetings, I'll post that in the chat. And that is all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Chairman Friedman. Thank you, Chairman Abbasi. Um, we're gonna call the meeting of the Housing and Community Development Committee to order and Kyle, should we do a roll call to start that? Uh, we can go ahead and call roll, but I think we'll need to, to do it again um, when okay. the additional members will roll on in a few minutes. But. Well, we can then wait. We can wait. That's fine with me. So we'll adjust. I guess we'll adjust the order of the agenda and do the uh, action plan update as a start because there's no uh, vote on that. So we'll call on uh, Deputy Chief Deputy Pam Kestner. Thank you, Chairman Friedman. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pam Kessner. I um, met many of you, uh, Chief Deputy at the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm also serving as Acting Deputy Director for the Division of Housing. And I'm here to provide you just a brief um, overview and update as to our consolidated planning um, process and annual action plan. Um, Kyle, were you bringing that up or should should I? The, the PowerPoint. Or, sorry. Pull, pulling it up right now, I think. Okay, thank you. So while Kyle is pulling that up, um, the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development requires states and communities to develop a consolidated planning process that is a five-year plan. And then each year thereafter, um, you must provide an annual action plan update that provides um, the community an opportunity to hear proposed changes to the plan as well as how to use um, the, the resources included. So you can move to the next um, slide, Kyle. Um, the annual action plan uh, and proposed uses of resources include federal resources, and those resources are home dollars, the National Housing Trust Fund, Emergency Solutions Grant, which is focused on homelessness reduction, uh, housing opportunities for people with AIDS are also known as HAPWA, and then lastly, the Community and Development Block Grant, also known as CDBG. So those are the federal resources that we include in um, our consolidated plan as well as the annual action plan. We, DHCD, we also include in the um, annual um, input process um, the Virginia Housing Trust Fund. And um, as you all know, DHCD um, oversees the State Housing Trust Fund, and we use this input process as an opportunity to share with the community um, proposed uses for the trust fund. We will also um, include um, highlights as to what changes we anticipate from the original consolidated plan, um, as well as the Virginia Housing Trust Fund. 
and then lastly, we also have state funds um, through permanent supportive housing. Um, and uh, PSH is a priority of the governors and we provide opportunities for communities to hear how we plan to use PSH funding and our um, strategies of incorporating um, a collaborative approach because for uh, many of you, you know, PSH requires not only the creation of units, uh, but also bringing in supportive services in order to um, house individuals in PSH and maintain that housing. So who completes the consolidated plan and action plan? Um, as I mentioned, it's uh, required by HUD. It is completed by the state, a locality or consortium uh, that receives um, resources directly from HUD and uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia were one of the recipients. And then we in turn um, provide methods of distribution. So we get input on our um, uh, methodology of distribution. We also, DHC also provides a plan for the balance of state. So many um, localities are deemed um, entitlement localities for a variety of, uh, for these programs. And so those entitlement communities actually receive direct funding from HUD for those communities, which tend to be more rural and small towns, um, they are considered the balance of state. And so they fall under DHCD. What's included in the, the plan, um, uh, we conduct needs assessments, strategic plan, annual goals. We focus on housing, homelessness, and community development as the resources indicated. We also provide public input and feedback from service providers, housing developers, other state agencies, localities, and then the Continua of Care Network. The Continua of Care Network um, is the network of our homeless service system here in Virginia. Next slide. So each spring, um, we uh, develop a draft of our annual action plan. So the one that we are um, reviewing now is the action plan for 2020-2021. The public comment period begins in the fall, um, October 1st, and runs through April 16th. A draft, initial draft of the plan will be posted on April 2nd, and a public hearing will be held on April 15th, um, which will be announced in public legal, legal notices across the state. On April um, 16th, that will be the last day we receive input um, from the community. Uh, it can be provided um, either during uh, input sessions or uh, on our website, we have links. Um, and then at the public um, comment, um, public hearing, excuse me, on April 15th. From there, we, uh, staff will incorporate um, recommendations that um, line up with priorities uh, and then submit a draft um, plan for your review and approval. Um, which is anticipated would be at, at your board meeting in May. And then once approved, um, we will submit that plan to HUD. Now, as you may recall, um, for those of you that were on the board last year, this was about the time when everything broke loose with the pandemic. So we had to make some major adjustments um, with last year's plan. So this year is a little different, even though we're still in a, um, a virtual mode, uh, we are um, planning to move forward um, as expected. We, I think you can go to the next slide, um, Kyle. Um, so these virtual input sessions, we held them and you'll see a list in a second um, last year, uh, last year, last week. Uh, we conducted um, sessions across the state, even though they were virtual, we made them regional in scope, allowing um, 
the potential opportunity for collaboration or discussion of specific issues related to a particular region. Uh, but we also made it open so that if you miss um, the one in your particular region, you could always attend the virtual session for another region. I mentioned that um, written comments are due by April 16th uh, to Casey Ensign, one of our policy members at DHCD. Written comments can also be made online. The public hearing on April 15th will be held at 10 a.m. That of of course, we're virtual, and then we encourage others to provide um, uh, to encourage others to provide input. If indeed you have colleagues or know folks that may not have had an opportunity to participate in any of the input sessions or public hearing. Next slide. So Lindsay Austin and Matt Weaver, uh, they are our policy folks that are. Um, uh, point on our uh, consolidated and annual action plan. Uh, Lindsay's with the housing division and Matt is with the community development division. I did want to give you a, a heads up that um, you heard from us in the late summer, early fall last year related to um, COVID relief funds that states had access to through the Community Development Block Grant. And we had originally um, had planned to utilize a, um, the second and third tranche of CDBG CV funds for our rent and mortgage relief program. We anticipated that um, we would be able to use it for mortgage relief. And um, as, it, as it turns out, we um, determined that CDBG was not a good fit for mortgage relief. There were too many um, challenges related to the HUD requirements. Um, it's not that the requirements weren't a good thing, it just wasn't a good fit for mortgage relief. So, um, when we ended the utilizing funds, the COVID relief funds for the rent and mortgage relief, we had the opportunity to use housing trust fund, the state housing trust fund for a um, um, period of time to finish up rent relief as, or finish or to bridge rent relief from one federal source to the new source. You all, I'm sure, have heard about the Emergency Rental Assistance Program that was approved on December 27th. So uh, we were able to continue to provide rent relief um, with the Housing Trust Fund while we, wait, while we waited for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program to come online. So we also used Housing Trust Fund for mortgage relief. And as of the end of January, we decided to um, end mortgage relief through that um, program while we await um, the next iteration or the next uh, stimulus package, which indeed does include the um, um, funds to assist with mortgage relief. Um, it's yet to be determined how that will be distributed here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but we're pleased that um, it is included in this package. So we are in the process of updating the CDBG COVID uh, relief, um, the, the action plan that we're submitting an am amended action plan for that source of funds since we're not gonna use it for mortgage relief. We're going to um, extend those resources, not only for localities um, to utilize, we have several that have already submitted potential projects, but also we have a huge need here in the Commonwealth to provide non-congregate shelter for those individuals and families experiencing homelessness, um, but who need to be in a more, isolate, a more isolated location, such as um, a hotel or a motel. So non-congregate shelter is basically providing um, 
vouchers to cover the costs of staying in a hotel motel. And individuals eligible for those vouchers are one are people who um, have tested positive for COVID or who have been exposed to someone who has tested positive, someone who has um, uh, underlying health conditions or who are 65 years old or older. Again, the non-congregate shelter is to protect those experiencing homelessness from exposure to, to uh, the COVID virus. So more to come, you'll hear more about that. We plan to um, incorporate that into the public hearing in April and submit the amended plan to, to HUD thereafter. Be happy to answer any questions. Um, you'll hear you know, many more specifics about the proposed plan at the May board meeting. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I just want to, Pam, great, great overview and, and um, of the presentation. Just two things I wanted to highlight of what Pam said is that I'm very, just really want to thank her and the team that works on the emergency rental assistance for their leadership uh, and Susan Dewey and her team at Virginia Housing. We are one of only two states uh, that we're aware of that, uh, and, and you know, because of the governor and general assembly's leadership, we went from coronavirus relief funds, keeping the rent mortgage relief program going to that bridge with the housing trust fund, which was at the darkest days of the pandemic in terms of still having rental assistance available. And many states are still waiting to begin emergency rental assistance, one that was passed back in December. And um, Pam, wow. and Susan and team have made sure that Virginia was one of only two states that immediately dealing with complicated financial things in terms of the transition kept that relief going and kept that access. So I just, I can't say enough how much I appreciate the Governor and General Assembly and the teams that have been deploying these resources. Um, we'll talk more in my director's report about the, you know, the good news on the General Assembly and Governor providing even more funds for the Housing Trust Fund and then the Recovery Act that just passed, the, the housing components of that. Um, the only other note I wanna make sure you're aware of is that, uh, with the housing trust fund and you know that going to be 55 million in the base continuing to next year and then the it stayed at 70.7 million for this fiscal year uh, when going into next fiscal year that much of the new federal resources are in the form of rental assistance uh, and mortgage assistance one of the things we still uh, need the housing trust fund for desperately is construction soft construction loans to help with the increasing the supply of affordable housing. And, and so we will likely be coming back to you at the May meeting with, uh, um, if you recall for new board members, we went from the historic 80% for construction loans to and 20% for homeless reduction grants to a 60%, 40% split. And so we're, um, you know, at getting input on potentially going back to that 80, 20, given the, the rush of emergency federal need and using some of these state trust fund dollars uh, for the construction side. So just wanted to flag that. And again, thanks to Pam and, and her team and, and Susan and her team for um, leading so much on the rental assistance. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thanks, Pam. I definitely want to second everything that Eric said about you guys getting this program going. It's been a great statewide, you know, effort that took a big burden off localities like us, so thank you. Um, other questions for Pam? Mr. Chair, I believe Ms. Dewey has her hand raised. Go ahead, Susan. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I, d I just wanna return those kudos to uh, Eric and Pam. They've been doing a, a great job. It. Um, I, I feel like I talk to them more than I talk to my family <laughs> these days. <laughs> um, and that's even while I'm working from home. So um, they've just done a great job. Um, just a quick question that I had earlier, Pam, when you were given your presentation, how many regions are you all looking? How have you divided the state in, into regions? You don't, li you don't have to list them all out, but how many are there? Uh, we, as it relates to our input sessions, 
Yes. We, we break the state up into four areas. So basically okay. Eastern, Northern, Central, and Southwest. I think is that okay. how. Yeah. It's That's right. always a, a challenge in our state is it how is. to divide the, the state into regions. Some are clear cut and others not so much. So anyway, thank right. you. Some overlap. Um, luckily, with the virtual world, um, we've had more participation in <laughs> input virtual input sessions than we've ever had in the past. So um, I think going forward, this is something that we may want to consider um, having uh, a mix of both yeah. virtual as well as in person. I totally agree. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Susan. Um, Anybody else? I do have one of my own questions, maybe two. Anybody else? So Pam, um, is mortgage relief currently available statewide? Not currently, uh, Andy. What we've what we're doing since we needed to end, we we were coming um, to the cap on the state housing trust fund, so we needed to end the mortgage relief program um, at the end of January. For those households who already had a application in queue and who were not protected by the forbearance, you know, currently there's a uh, forbearance in place um, until the end of June. Our, um, our the um, support center that's been operating for the rent and mortgage relief program and now just rent relief program, uh, they are processing those applications. So we're still um, in the process, but we're not accepting new. Okay. Um, so once we hear more about the um, American Rescue Plan details, um, we'll be, um, I guess there'll be a determination made uh, as to which, what organization will take the lead on mortgage relief here in the Commonwealth. Great. So this might not be right on the subject of the annual plan, but I just want to say that with Eric and Susan and Pam, with your leadership on the, the rental relief thing, and with uh, your staff's, you know, coordination of the CHIRP funds to localities, the truth is, is that you are becoming a statewide housing policy leadership organization and not just balance of state. And I actually encourage you to continue that and have some additional conversations like we had about the rental relief, which sounded like maybe, I think that was actually a policy conversation and it was a good one. And I suggest that we have a, a pro, you invite people to a proactive discussion of the state's plans for the, the new funding and how localities who are interested, they don't all have to be interested, but I would be, understand what you guys are doing so we can tailor what we have with the funds we receive to complement that in a proactive way. So I just suggest that. I know you have everything you need in the world to do, but it really is a complete change in our housing policy and funding environment right now. Mr. Chair, I, I appreciate that advice and we, we definitely want to continue that conversation because as you know, it's not just the new housing funds, but then there's a bunch of new local funds coming, local and right. state uh, flexible funds, similar to the CRF of last time. So, you know, that dialogue is going to be more important than ever. Uh, so yeah, I agree and appreciate your, your help with those conversations. Absolutely. Susan. And one thing to add is when we first started this um, last summer, everybody was looking at for us, basically four months, just how can we get this money out as quickly as possible to provide rent relief through the landlord program. And now what we're seeing, I guess this goes back to your point, Andy, um, is this is, we're in this for the long term. You know, this is, these programs are four and five years going out and who knows beyond that. Um, my experience with back in the last recession, which was a foreclosure crisis, there was some federal money that went out to some states for hardest hit funds. They are just now closing that out and it's a decade more later. So we got to have, I think all of us more of a long-term perspective on these programs 
than just a quick relief program. Great. Thank you. I think that's different. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Pam. So, um, Kyle, are we back? Do we have a quorum yet for the committee meeting? Mr. Chair, I believe we do. If, if you'd like me to call the roll. Yes, please. Okay. Mr. Abbasi? Present. Ms. Cotton? Present. Ms. Dewey? Present. Mr. Friedman? Present. Mr. Gregory? Ms. Halleck? Present. Mr. Jackson? Present. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Abby Johnson? Mr. Keith Johnson? Ms. Monique Johnson? Present. And Mr. Maringoff? Present. Ms. Shields? Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thanks, Kyle. So we'll move on to the consent agenda, which is the approval of the minutes of the January 25th, 2021 meeting. I need a motion and a second to approve those minutes. So motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, Kyle. Mr. Abbasi. Uh, approve. Ms. Cotton. Approve. Ms. Dewey. Approve. Mr. Friedman. Approve. Ms. Halleck. Approve. Mr. Jackson. Approved. Ms. Monique Johnson. Approve. And Mr. Maring. Approved. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thanks very much. Okay, we're going to move on then to the action item on the committee's agenda, which is the Port Host Community Revitalization Fund Guidelines, a proposed change to those guidelines. And I hope we have Rebecca Rowe from the Community Revitalization Office to talk to us about that. Yes, Mr. Chair. Rebecca Rowe, our, our Associate Director for Community Re Revitalization is with us. I'm just gonna uh, mention a quick couple things first to, to um, big picture uh, for the board on the Port Host Program. Just to refresh folks' memories that this, this Port Host Community Revitalization Fund Program is under the uh, same code section as the Industrial Revitalization Fund or the Derelict Structures Fund. It's in the, the code of Virginia, and so we have a we do have an industrial revitalization fund program, which you amended to approve the amended guidelines at a couple of the recent board meetings. Uh, several years ago, the the general assembly and governor created this port host program as a subset focused on the five port host communities, uh, and and basically it was, the program's been at a million dollars, and we've gone through two funding rounds so far. Um, the, the Rebecca Rowe and team received feedback from the port host communities as we're, you know, going into our third funding cycle for next fiscal year, and got some uh, feedback and advice from them, and and uh, then you know shared these draft guidelines with this this group of port host communities uh, before this packet is coming to you. So Rebecca is going to go over the the, um, the main changes. Uh, and it's the board packet, starting with a memo on page 11 of your, of your packet. The General Assembly did just, the program is $1 million in funding per, per year, and, and the, the conference budget that just went through the final um, General Assembly vote was moved that up by 500000 So the program's at $1.5 million right now. Uh, that's not final to the governor signs the, the final budget, but uh, we have incorporated that $1.5 million for planning purposes into this document. So I'll turn it over to Rebecca and thank her and her team for the work on getting input and, and uh, delivering this program, which is really critical for uh, you know, the unique economic challenges with derelict structures around port, port um, communities and remembering that the, the, land, the land that the port serves itself is not taxable for our port host communities. So the, the in economic investments around the port on privately owned land is especially critical to the economic tax base for the port host community. So I'll turn it to Rebecca. Welcome, Rebecca. Um, thank you, Eric, and thank you, um, Andy, as well. Good morning, everyone. So there are 
five communities that are the target of the port host program, Richmond, Front Royal, Norfolk, uh, Newport News, and Portsmouth are those communities. Um, as Eric said, we are hoping for, anticipating a budget increase from 1 million to 1.5 million, and that is reflected in the adjusted funding amounts that we are proposing. So what we heard from those communities when we reflected on the 2020 and 2021 rounds is that it's better for them to have a, a greater surety of even a lower dollar amount than to um, have a question around a higher dollar amount, which is why we are asking for that change from the uh, surety of up to 150,000 to up to 250,000. And then any unallocated funds would continue to go into a, an as needed pool. And the applicants would let us know um, what their need is above and beyond that $250,000. And that would be allocated based on the statement of need and the amount of in grant requests that we would get for that year. Um, so it's not a, a big change from the way the program has been in the past, just um, increasing that amount a little bit. Also bringing the program more into line with the way IRF is administered and saying that it we would extend the eligibility, not just to the unit of local government, but also potentially to an EDA or an IDA that would be acting um, as the fiduciary party for the unit of local government. And then removing the performance agreement uh, requirement as it, it really is a redundancy based on our contract with the locality when we grant funds to them and then the performance agreement that they get with private developers if there is a private developer uh, in the project. So those are the changes that we are proposing and um, I can answer questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Monique's got a question. Hi, Rebecca. Um, quick question for you. So you said that there are five communities Correct. Um, that are targeted. So over the past two funding rounds, have you found that all of those communities have used or taken advantage of the resources in some way, shape or form? Uh, no. In fact, for the last two rounds or the first two rounds, um, it's really only Norfolk, Newport News, and Portsmouth that have applied. The City of Richmond and Front Royal have not to this point applied. We have had uh, specific technical assistance calls with them in the past and at that have not resulted in applications. We have stepped up those efforts this year and we are very actively working with the city of Richmond on an application. And the, the transition of asking for the EDA or the IDA potentially to be the applicant is uh, specifically in response to some of the issues occurring in Warren County and Front Royal right now, that the units of local government um, may not be the appropriate applicants for these funds, but an EDA or IDA could take advantage of this program and have the capacity to apply for the funds and to oversee their deployment in a beneficial way. Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're actively outreaching to those communities that haven't taken advantage of the resources, because uh, I'm assuming they too, um, you know, haven't really been weighing in because they might have some insight um, that could inform some shifts that would make it, you know, even more attractive for those communities to also participate. So, so we did have a, a group call that we, we made the call for all five communities to be on that call to talk about the last few rounds. Um, again, Richmond and Front Royal did not join us on that call. So we made individual appointments with their economic development teams and we just spoke with those communities individually. So their feedback was taken into account um, in putting this together, specifically the that change around the EDAs and IDAs to, to try to make it a more accessible program specifically to Front Royal. But also, again, it, 
it's just a change that makes it more similar to the industrial revitalization fund program as well. Thank you. Brett's got a question. Go ahead, Brett. Um, hi, Rebecca. Um, can you talk a little bit about historical um, application volume, how much, how many, and around those five areas? Yeah, so <clears throat> we've only had two rounds of applications so far, and only five communities are eligible to apply. So both fiscal year 2020 and 2021, we had three communities, so three applications each time. Um, and now, of course, I'm going to forget, I, I think in each instance, um, two localities got $250,000 and then a third locality got $500,000. Mm -hmm. And in uh, with the Menchville Mariana project specifically, they are applying for that same project in multiple rounds, just doing phase one, phase two. So we're only getting one application per locality per round. And the way the program has been set up in the past is that each locality could apply for up to $150,000 and then provide a statement of need if there was a balance of funds remaining in the $1 million as to why they should get above the $150,000, which is what has resulted in the $500,250. Does that answer the question? Yes, that's helpful context. I do have a follow-up, though, to that, which is... Um, I noticed the financing terms and the, there's a two and a half percent interest with the 10 year amortization and that, and I'm wondering if, I mean, today's environment that is a fairly high uh, rate and um, payment. And I don't know if that it, if you think that's impacting the volume of applications or the feasibility of utilizing the funds. Uh, we did not hear that feedback from the localities, and the volume of applications is never going to be more than five. Um, I don't, yeah, we did not hear, get that feedback from either of the two localities that have not applied for the funds, that that was a barrier for them. And mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, the language is that that is uh, a guideline and that the locality can come to us and say, well, these are the terms by which we are loaning and, and we can give a thumbs up or thumbs down to those specific terms. And mostly what we're looking for there is that they are not turning it into a forgivable loan or, or something like that, but we would have some flexibility according to the marketplace on what terms they are offering on that loan. Okay, all right, thank you. This is uh, Eric, I'll just mention too that, you know, the, the work group around this, um, mm -hmm. we have a real priority to get Richmond and Front Royal uh, applications ready. Uh, you know, the, the work group that started a lot of this was Portsmouth and Newport News. It was, it was the hands of the to help kind of spearhead this legislation. So they had some mm -hmm. projects kind of ready, uh, I believe, for some of the first couple rounds. And, and the way, you know, the good thing about, while well, it's only a million a year, with the idea of these funds becoming revolving, Will help the localities continue to do that you know work around their privately developable lands support facilities for economic development so, great thank, thank you other questions for rebecca or eric on this uh, yes this is sylvia uh rebecca it would it be appropriate for you to give us some examples of how those funds have been used i'm particularly interested in portsmouth particularly interested in Portsmouth? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, I did not have that right at my fingertips with everything open, but I'm jumping into our server here to see what we funded in Portsmouth. Rebecca, this is Jay. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So, Thanks, Jay. Um, the, uh, the city of Portsmouth, we have um, Lovett Point. So this year, uh, $500,000 uh, was awarded. This is a 51-acre site. Um, this is owned by Thomas 
Industrial LLC, um, and this is in partnership with its parent company, uh, Marathon Development Group. Um, and so the site's going to be restored. There's asbestos. Um, they're going to do other things with the existing buildings and foundation. And again, like Eric was mentioning and Rebecca was mentioning, these are privately owned sites um, near or, you know, uh, associated with the port. And so bringing, bringing new vitality to that um, uh, Love It Point site. So, so we hope that is a little bit helpful for you. And in fiscal year 2020, um, the funds for Portsmouth went to demolish a decommissioned coal facility um, to be able to provide uh, more of a construction ready site there near the port. And, and once those uh, sites are cleaned up, uh, could that land be used? What, what could that land be used for? Could it be used for housing or does it have to be industrial use? Um, according to the port host program guidelines, housing can be a part of the project, but it would and depend on um, circumstances on the ground as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jay, Rebecca, and Sylvia. Anybody else have a question on this? Okay, then at this time, I'd be happy to entertain a motion to recommend, it, recommend the approval of the amended guidelines to the full board. So motioned. Anybody have a second? Second. Great, okay, Kyle. Mr. Aye. Ms. Patton? Yes. Ms. Dewey? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ms. Halleck? Uh, yes. Mr. Jackson? Yes. Uh, Ms. Monique Johnson? Yes. And Mr. Marinoff? Yes. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you very much. The only there's no nothing else on the agenda except if any member has any new business. Okay, hearing none, what's the do we need to take a vote to adjourn or can we just adjourn? I think you can adjourn, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We can adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Kyle, did you want to take a break before? Um, calling the, the main meeting to order or so Mr. Chair, I believe we have a probably about at least an hour on that main meeting agenda so if you'd like for everyone to have a five minute break we can do that or uh, and then and then we can come right back if that suits you. All right. I got 1046 so let's be back at 1051 so we can start and go through the agenda. Thank you Mr. Chair.
All right, I have uh, ten fifty two, so I think we can go ahead and get get started. Give people a second to log back on. All right, I'm seeing people light up again on their camera, so um, I will call the Board of Housing Community Development meeting to order. With that, I'll turn it over to Kyle to for a roll uh, for a roll call. Call roll. Sorry. Sure. Uh, Mr. Abbasi. Present. Ms. Cotton. Present. Ms. Dewey. Present. Mr. Farrell. Present. Mr. Friedman. Present. Mr. Gregory. Ms. Halleck. Present. Mr. Jackson. Present. Ms. Abby Johnson. Mr. Keith Johnson. Ms. Monique Johnson. Present. Mr. Maringall. Present. And Ms. Shields. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we will now hear public comment. If you've not already indicated with Kyle that you wish to speak, speak please enter your name in the chat box. We'll begin by calling on individuals who previously indicated they wish to speak. Kyle, I'll turn it over to you now to announce any individuals who have signed up um, or for anybody in the chat. Uh, Mr. Chair, no one has previously indicated they wish to offer comment. Um, again, if anybody wants to comment, um, and it uh, sounds like we have nobody previously signed up, please put your name in the chat box now so Kyle can call on you. We'll give you a minute. Kyle, is there anybody in the chat? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. So I'll do one final call for public comments. Is there anyone else on the phone or in the meeting room that would like to make a public comment? Give it 10 seconds. Okay, great. Um, we'll move on then to the consent agenda. Um, first item is uh, approval of the minutes from January 25th, 2021, which has been previously circulated. Um, I will entertain a motion uh, and a second for the approval of the minutes. All motion. Okay. I'll second. Okay, with that, I'll uh, recognize Kyle to call call roll roll call vote. Mr. Abbasi. Approved. Ms. Cotton. Approved. Ms. Dewey. Approved. Mr. Farrell. Aye. Mr. Friedman. Aye. Ms. Halleck. Aye. Ms. Halleck. Approved. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Ms. Monique Johnson. Approved. Mr. Maringoff. Approved. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. And with that, I will um, ask for a report from the committee chair of the Housing and the Community Development Committee, Andy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Housing and Community Development Committee approved a motion to recommend to this board approval of the Port Host Community Revitalization Fund guidelines as uh, presented by the staff to us in the board package. So we present that uh, recommendation to the board, full board for your consideration. Thank you. Um, I would need. Uh, it, it comes to us as a standing motion, so um, can, uh, can I get a second on that? Second. Okay, great. Kyle, if you can call the roll on that. Mr. Abbasi. Approved. Ms. Cotton. Approved. Ms. Dewey. Approved. Mr. Farrell. Aye. Mr. Friedman. Aye. Ms. Halleck. Aye. Ms. Halleck. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Approved. Approved. Ms. Monique Johnson. Approved. And Mr. Marinoff. Approved. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you.
Andy, is there any other information that we need to know from the Housing Community Development Committee at this point? No other recommendations to the full board from the committee, Mr. Chairman. Great. So we'll go to the code change cycle update and I'll turn it over to staff for that. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll start this with the action item and then um, we can do that first and then uh, discuss a couple other things as well. Um, the action item before you, it's we're currently with the regulations in their final adoption period to the end of March. Um, so at this point, if there are petitions regarding changes between proposed and final regulations, um, that they could be suspended for additional comment. This, this action, and it's um, exactly what we did in the last cycle, allows staff to, to do the suspension and open up that second comment period. Um, it, it wouldn't be making any regulatory changes or anything like that until it's back before the board again. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Or if Cindy had anything to add also. Not related to that. Thank you, Kyle. It's found on page 32 of your board packet, everybody. Okay. Have any other items, Cindy? Um, so I did want to give the uh, board, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, a little bit of an up update, just to remind you all that the effective date of the codes will be July 1st, um, and that we are preparing for um, your review, the schedule for the next code update cycle. Um, and Kyle, do you want to talk about the um, the missing sections? Do you want me to jump in and do that? Um, Cindy and Mr. Chair, can, can we complete the action item um, if we can and then jump into the other pieces? Oh, sorry. I forgot you had needed a roll call vote. My apologies. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? All motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Kyle, if you could call the vote, please. Mr. Abbasi. Approved. Ms. Cotton? Yes. Ms. Dewey? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Aye. Mr. Friedman? Aye. Uh, Ms. Halleck? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Ms. Monique Johnson? Aye. Mr. Marinol. Aye. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll jump into the, the next piece um, Cindy was talking about. Um, so in October, as you may recall, was the meeting where the board um, went over individual code change proposals, um, so kind of one by one. And in the fire code, there were a number of individual changes in chapters 12 and 20, which was um, aviation and energy systems with the two chapters. Um, those changes were all uh, approved as consensus items. And between October and December, um, the, those two chapters were left out of the materials provided in December. Um, just it was by an error and um, as such they will need to come back to the board um, and we're doing everything we're working with the relevant parties um, to, to keep everything on track as much as we can um, that being said as those are part of the fire code we want to make sure we uh, engage our partners at fire services as well as you might recall those involved the, the committee in the joint meeting um, but we can answer any questions or Cindy if you had any other update on that um. now I think that I think that covers it you know just to clarify that the as part of the edit process it was uh, reviewed and approved there was no controversy everybody everyone was con um, in agreement that it was consensus um, and then as the information was submitted into the code commission when it was for whatever reason uh, it did not get published um, 
when we put that document in front of you at the December meeting, there were uh, chapter 12 and a couple of sections in chapter 20 were missing. It's related to aviation um, and uh, they disappeared between proposed and, and final. So in an abundance of caution, we're putting them before you yet again. Um, some of them will be before you for the third time and um, we hope to be able to do that as quickly as possible. And we do not anticipate any impact on the final regulations. So is that anticipated so at the next meeting? Uh, yes, it will be necessary. Kyle, jump in here, but I believe it, it's going to be necessary to um, have the uh, fire services board again. It, hopefully it's only going to be a very short meeting um, and we haven't, decided on what date that's going to occur yet. So I guess maybe that's going to be a discussion for either the end of this meeting or uh, I'm not yeah, sure yeah. how I'll we're going to do that, Eric. Yeah, I'll jump in there. Um, thank you, Cindy and Mr. Chair. So uh, you'll, you'll note later in your packet when we have the future board meeting date, the May 10th on your calendar, uh, that we may need to change or additional meeting added. We we really need to wait till after the petition period to, to work, and then we'll work with Fire Services Board too, where we, we hope we can still keep that May 10th date and get everything done um, that on the code process that's needed. And then you, you heard in your report this morning from the Housing and Community Development Committee, we also have a timeline for the, the HUD approvals to, to get out those funds. So uh, I will ask for, for some, request some flexibility for you all to, to we might need a very short kind of two meetings for this based on some of the timing of both of those processes but we should know in early april um so just hold that may 10th and then we'll, we'll be back to um to give you some more information on and work with the chairs on uh whether we need actually an april meeting potentially the short april meeting on the the code process that, that's that's what where we're at right now all right perfect uh, Cindy or Kyle, anything additional to report? All right, great. We'll move on to reports and information. Um, Director Dewey for the Virginia Housing Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, as you've heard, we are working on some of the um, new programs that help us distribute money for rent relief, as well as gearing up um, to assist with anything that's due with mortgage relief. <clears throat> we are also, um, I'm assuming, I don't want to steal the thunder of your executive director, so I'm quite sure Eric's going to talk about some of the efforts around the uh, report pursuant to House Bill 854. Um, so I'll let him do that. I did want to mention, however, that there has been uh, legislation uh, approved by the General Assembly to establish an opportunity tax credit, which uh, we're still trying to kind of fine tune exactly the intent from the General Assembly, but this will establish a parallel to the federal low income housing tax credit program. We did a study um, pursuant to House Bill 810 last year on what that would look like. And so we will be uh, probably needing to implement that right away. It's on a sh short uh, time track. So more to come about that. This year is also the year in which we are gonna be um, going around and having forums for recommended changes to our qualified allocation plan, which really directs how the federal tax credits are allocated. Likely this will um, dovetail into that process as well. So we'll keep you posted. Um, that's uh, pretty much all I have today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and I, I haven't seen uh, Rich Gregory on, but uh, we need to give the report of the Virginia Fire Services Board. Oh, sorry, uh, Ms. Cotton had raised her hand. I think she had a question first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Susan, is am I correct? I think the last thing I saw from General Assembly was it's fifteen million over five years for the tax credit. Is that what got through appropriations? There is um yes. 
Okay. That's the short answer. Okay. Um, I think there is some uncertainty as to whether or not that is a flat $75 million program or whether like the federal credit is more of an additive process. So you get it in one year and then you get it in the next and the next and the next and next. So it would mushroom to more like a $750 million program. Okay. We're still trying to get clarity on the intent behind that legislation. Um, we're working, uh, of course, with DHCD, also with the Department of Taxation. They really have the lead on this because it is a um, tax credit. And as you all know, the difference with a tax credit is it really comes off the top of state uh, revenues as opposed to an appropriated expense. So a little bit different um, process. Okay, thank you. We'll keep you posted as we know more. Then Susan, question, um, has, is there anything in the legislation or hasn't been discussed how the credit will be allocated if it'll be a certificate or if it will be allocated to the owner, you know, much like the federal credit? Is there any, any discussion on how that's going to be structured? There is discussion. And again, I think that's one of those points of, of clarification yeah. as well. Um, okay. Yeah, as you can imagine, uh, because the bill was introduced both in the House and the Senate, um, initially did not pass the House, it passed the Senate, went to conference. So there have been some back and forth. And we are uh, really working right now with the governor's office to try to get clarity on um, what the intent is so we'll know how to roll out a program. Okay. A lot, to, a lot to be determined. Sure. Understood. Eric, is there anything you would like to add about that? I think you covered it really well, Susan, just that, you know, it's still being considered by the governor's office and looking at the, looking at trying to figure out some more clarity on it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dewey, Director Johnson. Um, any further questions for Director Dewey regarding any other matters? All right, uh, hearing none. Um, Kyle, I don't know if there's somebody that can give the report of the Virginia Fire Services Board. Keith is also out today. Yeah, that's why I noticed. All right, so we can just table that for um, the, the the next meeting, I guess. Um, and then, uh, last but not certainly least, of the of the director reports or the the, the reports, Director Johnston. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, everyone, for being with us this morning. It really goes without saying that it's really historic times right now in terms of, obviously, for our nation, but uh, but in housing policy, uh, in the policy areas, it's especially historic in terms of new federal and state investments, and then just a lot of um, impact on um, on all the areas that we serve at DHCD. So um, I'll give it just a couple quick updates on the federal legislation that just passed, uh, the, some of the new funding in the state, proposed in the state budget that's still uh, yet to be acted on by the governor. And then um, just mention a couple quick bills um, that were that were passed uh, last, this session. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do see that uh, Mr. Freeman has a hand up. I don't know if it's in regards to- Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Sorry, that was a mistake. No questions. No problem. So, so we're we're on to the the third major stimulus that that has passed since the pandemic, and um, as we we talked about briefly in the housing and community development meeting earlier, that program has an emergency or rental assistance 2.0 in it, a, an additional 18.7 billion for states and eligible local governments. And some, I think important to note is some longer spend deadlines with those funds uh, being able to be spent for the next uh, four to five years. And then it does ex extend the deadline for the first emergency rental assistance, which was slated at the end at the end of this year. But there's some major clarifications that we're gonna be seeking from treasury uh, to, to figure out US, the US Department of Treasury, because there's some um, some pieces of the the code that that we're trying to figure out in terms of obligation versus spend deadlines. The really good news in terms of our emergency rental assistance is that 
the U.S. Treasury did put out some additional guidance for the first slot of funds that we received as a Commonwealth, $524 million, with uh, Fairfax and Chesterfield counties also receiving their own allocation to operate in their localities. But the, the Treasury did provide some additional flexibility for states and localities in implementing, which we think are going to be very helpful to getting the funds out to those who need it most and in ease some of the administrative burden. They haven't answered all of our questions, but they uh, there, there was some good news in that second round of guidance for the first round of funds. So uh, again, that's our biggest new effort and biggest new um, pandemic related need uh, as, as we, it, we hopefully are, you know, on the waning days of the pandemic's uh, largest impacts, but the Congress has has noted the need for emergency rental assistance in the recovery period for the nation as well. So that's going to uh, be continue to be a major focus. I'll just mention that we have through February 24th deployed 96.5 million in rent mortgage relief payments to 23,000 Virginians. Um, the other piece that Pam mentioned earlier is that there there is in the the recent pack, federal package 9.39 billion to mitigate the damage of uh, need for mortgage assistance and, and remembering that the through June there are some additional protect federal protections on on uh, for mortgages there is additional funds as well for uh, through home which would would be potentially something that would come back through this board uh, because of its being the first funding I'm mentioning going through HUD. The previous mortgage and rental assistance continues through the U.S. Treasury Department. This $5 billion through home would go through the, the home uh, program at, at HUD, but then be used by the states and, for, and localities for um, homelessness assistance. And so we're, we have our trade association conference actually this week where we're, we're hoping to learn a lot more about uh, HUD's plans for those funds. And then there, there are multiple other funding sources that uh, touch upon missionaries of our agency, many of them delivered by the federal government. The thing I want to highlight though is that there, there is additional state and local uh, general fund assistance, kind of like the coronavirus relief fund of uh, the first round. So we're, we're going to be monitoring that closely and, and as it has impacts on our community development block grant program being another s similar flexible program and especially the, the COVID care funds for CDBG. So uh, more to come as, as those guidelines continue to, to roll out. And then uh, turning to the state budget, the you know historic increases, thanks to the governor and general assembly in really across the board in our mission areas. Uh, as I mentioned, the housing trust fund is 70.7 .7 million in this fiscal year and is it 55 million next fiscal year? That that bump up in this fiscal year was to ensure that a bridge for the rent and mortgage relief program, and so that that bridge doesn't disproportionately impact our spring round of construction loans, because we do have a an upcoming spring round of of construction loans uh, through our affordable and social needs housing program. There's also uh, a study I will mention, House Bill 2053, that that provides uh, a small amount of budget assistance for us to look at accessory dwelling units and really on the zoning side uh, to look at increasing the supply of affordable housing through incentivizing local uh, adoption of uh, increased flexibility for accessory dwelling units. Uh, we have, Cindy and her team have, uh, have done a lot of work on the building code side uh, about ADUs, but uh, there's a additional push that delegates Samira uh, champion that, that did uh, make it through as a bill and then also some budget language to help us with the, the report that's needed there. I think that yeah, we mentioned the IRF increase. There's there's some increases for the planning district commissions for a state broadband map through the agency uh, through for a, a new program at our agency for community development financial institutions uh, and then the broadband program does get that boost to 50 million a year. Uh, the Enterprise Zone program did receive a, a, a small boost as well. And then I think the the other 
program I should should make you aware of is that we did have our first Reggie auction. So you might recall the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative has allowed the Commonwealth to create uh, both uh, half of those funds are going to DHCD to administer for increased uh, energy efficiency to benefit low income Virginians. And so we did have our first auction that um, was a bit higher than we had expected. So we're going to have it uh, at least 20, I think it's 27 million just from that first auction to deploy in, in uh, energy efficiency. And we'll, we'll continue to update you uh, as that program um, rolls out in the coming months. Um, so those are just a couple of the big budget updates. I, I did also want to mention that two, two bills, uh, one that will come that you'll be seeing on the regulatory side through this board's action is, is the Enterprise Zone program. House Bill 1881 uh, passed by Delegate Heretic, and it would basically, uh, um, it's a technical amendment for the Enterprise Zone Job Creation Grant Program that brings the program into conformity with the recent changes to the Virginia minimum wage. Uh, it also does add a, a, a one policy change that increases uh, the, some of the eligibility for uh, SWAM businesses, so there, that that is a good policy change in the bill as well. I see uh, Board Member Johnson has a question, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm happy to yep. take the question. Yeah, please, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Eric. Now, um, just, just a question, and this may be answered um, just in some of your subsequent comments, but as you're going through, there are just, I know there are a boatload of programs, dozens of programs, um, just different focuses and I'm wondering if you know at any point there would be an opportunity to just kind of have some sort of dashboard that kind of like outlines what they are the focus how much allocated because um, I you know I do have some questions but you know I don't want to get into the minutia but I guess just more broadly on a macro level kind of understanding that would help at least help me see where the intersecting points are and how, you know, where we're successful, where, you know, we may not be, but just to kind of really be able to probe in a different way, seeing it comprehensively would be helpful. Thank you. Ben. Periodically. Yeah, that, I appreciate that idea. So, um, and this this report is kind of hot off the press, not not yet approved by the governor. So what what I might suggest that, let's see if that, if this gets to kind of your interest, that, so there's a, many different program as you you all know that we have several boards uh, with oversight over different programs at dhcd um, the broadband we have the broadband advisory council we have the go virginia board uh, so i what i'll what i would recommend is that for the, the board of housing community development programs which the main increases in this recent general assembly would be the housing trust fund and that's one of our our key housing programs uh, really the key state housing program um, that, that we can, uh, you know, we, we did plan to provide more information on that program as we go into the, um, the May meeting. And then the, the, the IRF and Enterprise Zone programs are the other two programs that, that uh, the Board of Housing has oversight over the regulations, and, and we can provide um, some additional on that. But I, I, in terms of your, the touch points piece, um, because, you know, programs are related and intersect, um, I'd be happy to have a, a presentation once we, we get the final budget that, that would provide um, just an overview. Uh, and and we again, we, we you all, uh, the new board members came in, we were really focused on the uh, overview of the, the building code process. Uh, but now that we're into a really increase in the program, program grant program delivery areas, I'd be happy to give, a, a set aside some time for some of our different directors to, to give an overview of, of all the programs and kind of how they they intersect intersect with the board of housing community development oversight programs if if that would help them because you're right there's a lot of we have so many programs and we really try to look at it from an outcome and get the programs working together at our agency and others so it's a good suggestion we could um, look at either the may or you know coming up in the summer what uh, a kind of overview in the past we, we've had a, a retreat uh, where we we actually 
did a two day deep dive into all the programs so we can think through with the chairs as well you know the timing of when the next uh, retreat and whether whether we want to wait till we might be able to be more in person in the fall uh, we are planning for the, the the meetings through july to be virtual still uh, but but uh, that's that's some option as well as we as we go forward that, that would be great. Um, and, and just like I understand, Eric, that there are some programs that um, we, you know, don't really have responsibility for overseeing. But I think just in this environment, it's increasingly important that we just have a, a global understanding of just, you know, how energy and you know, economic development with the work that is probably being done with CDFIs and housing, how it all intersects. And so I think just seeing them all um, you know, just again, from time to time, I think would help kind of frame our thinking and, and help us inform you in, I guess, a meaningful way. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Johnson? That was Johnson and Johnston. Eric, anything else? Uh, the only other thing I was going to mention, uh, and that's a really great suggest some of board member Johnson, I think we we have a, a time to, to focus that on a future agenda, was just there is one, uh, I mentioned, that, you know, there will be some regulations coming back with those enterprise zone changes. There There is a House Bill uh, 2227 by Delegate Corey, and that has some um, changes that just require, they require the board to um, consider the new version of the International Energy Conservation Code uh, and, and consider adopting uh, those provisions. And we can go over that as, as after that's through the final regs, um, but the, uh, after that's through the final process with the governor's office. But um, that, that'll be incorporated into our, our next building code, uh, code cycle process, the Delegate Corey's request to, to look at um, a specific way to uh, consider IECC changes that that uh, come to pass. So, th those you know really, if you for past sessions, we've we've had a lot more bills that that would impact the board regs and and processes. Uh, this one, those would be the two main ones I'd mention, and and the the, ma the main changes are going to be with increased budget funding. So that concludes my report. Uh, Mr. Chair, and, and again, I just want to thank the, the DHCD team and the board for their support during this pandemic year. And we're really, like Susan said earlier, you know, working to position ourselves for the recovery and looking to long term as some of these pandemic programs become long term programs for the agency. OK, great. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, we'll move on to the next item, which is, is there any unfinished business by, uh, needed by board members? Okay, hearing none, do any board members have any new business? Hearing none, um, do any board members have other any other board matters? Okay, hearing none, um, back at Mr. Johnston um, for future board meeting dates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You can see in the board packet, May 10th is our scheduled next meeting. And as I mentioned earlier, we may need to come back to you with splitting that into to two meetings with a potential April meeting. Uh, the July 19th is the meeting proposed after that period. Just remember the July meeting is, is the meeting where we do elect the, the chair and, and vice chair and uh, potentially get any new board members uh, based on appointment, the appointment process that, that happens around that time of, around the fiscal year. So that's, again, we'll have a much clearer idea after the March 31st uh, time period and, and we'll get back with you soon about the, the next board meetings. So happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions vis-a-vis -vis the timing? Already hearing none. Um, Kyle, I'm assuming I need a motion to adjourn. Uh, yes, but I think you can do a voice vote. That'll be fine. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Or? All motion. Can I get a second? Second. All right. All those in favor? Uh, All right.
Any anyone opposed to adjourning? <laughs> All right, hearing none, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye.